right. No questions. Go ahead and type them in as usual whenever, whenever you have questions, um, and I'll keep an eye on the chat. So a uh, couple things uh, from the college. You you all should be getting an email about this soon, but they are implementing what they're calling a uh, no harm grading policy uh, this semester. So the way that that's going to work is there will be no Fs this semester. Not that any of you would be getting Fs, but there are no Fs this semester. Um, if you were to get an F instead, you will get something called an NP, which means no grade because of the pandemic. Uh, so Fs, or what would be what would otherwise have been an F, um, does not affect your GPA this semester. So that's helpful if you know. Let's say you've we're getting most of the class done, and then a couple of weeks from the end. Uh, somebody gets sick or something happens and you just can't complete the course and it's past the withdrawal deadline and all that. So um, that still prevents that from hurting your GPA. The other part of the uh, no harm grading policy is that any other, any A through C grade can be converted to a P for past. Um, and I don't do this and you don't have to decide this until the end of the semester until you actually have your grade. So let's say, um, you know, you go through everything and you end up with a C and you don't want that C on to be messing with your GPA, but you still pass this class. So you can convert that to a P and get credit. Um, the only issue with that is you have to watch if you are applying to some other program, um, like a program outside of Harper, They'll, they'll accept that grade. That may not be um, enough for them, but that may not be making a competitive applicant. So before you make that decision to convert your grade to a P, if you want to do that, uh, make sure that you um, check with, with whoever is going to see your grades later and make sure that's okay. So that said, let's uh, go back to where we were talking about alcohols. So where we finished up on, um, we were looking at uh, some, some reactions of alcohols. And one of the main things that we talked about here was that uh, OHs are going to be very, very poor leaving groups. So we can't just do direct substitution chemistry on alcohols because they just won't leave. Um, OH minus hydroxide is one of the strongest bases you're going to see. So in this context, so, um, so it's not going to leave by itself. So if you want to do substitution elimination chemistry, anything where OH is leaving, you have to make that OH into a better leaving group. And the way that we're going, that we're going to talk about that is by protonating it in acid. So we, we talked about how that works with substitution, which is typically SN1. And we talked about how that works with elimination, uh, which is typically E1. So there are lots of other ways, uh, actually better ways generally, that you can make OH into leaving groups. But uh, the book doesn't go through those, so we'll just save those for a more um, advanced class. All right, so to kind of review from last time and practice, um, I want to ask you what about primary alcohols? Okay, so let's say we have um, a primary alcohol. And we heat that up, would we still get a dehydration product? So the answer here is yes, this reaction still does occur. It takes a lot more heat, a lot more energy to do it, um, but it still does happen. But the mechanism is going to be a little bit different 
because we know that we're not going to form carbocations with primary alcohols. So if you could take a minute and see if you can write a probable mechanism for this reaction, I'll give you a hint. It's nothing new, um, but it is um, but it is something that's, a, that's different from what we did on Monday. So see if you can come up with a reasonable mechanism for the dehydration of a primary alcohol. Somebody type in something in the chat when you've got something. You don't have to like put it in answer, but just like say, okay, I got it or something. I got one. Yes, uh, it is E2. Um, so that's, that's exactly right. Because we can't do uh, e, SN1 or E1 on primary alcohols, because we can't form carbocations, we have to do it a different way. Um, so it's going to be e, uh, E2 instead. OK, let's try that. I don't like that color combination. All right, so we're going to protonate the alcohol. To make it into its leaving group again. Then here are our beta hydrogens that we're going to be deprotonating. So that, that leftover water then, one of the hydrogens, oops, form the double bond, and the leaving group leaves. So that actually leads us directly to our uh, product here. So that is an E2 mechanism.
So when we use primary alcohols, um, we're going to go through an E2 mechanism instead of an E1 mechanism. And again, as, as I've mentioned, the idea here isn't that you like create a bunch of flashcards and say, okay, primary alcohols go E2, secondary tertiary. Um, the idea is that you think through these things and try to figure out why something would or would not occur. In this case, one thing that you should uh, get to the point of being able to see is, all right, let's say you didn't remember this and the question on the uh, exam or quiz or whatever said, draw a mechanism for this reaction. So you start going and you end up drawing something like this. So let's say we protonate our alcohol. And you say, oh yeah, I know this. I remember this from the book. Uh, the next step is the alcohol leaves. And we've got this. So right away, that should kind of um, give, give you some pause, kind of a red flag, that you notice like, here's a primary cation. Like, really? Would that really work? Um, and hopefully, the more you practice this, the more you keep seeing it, it becomes clearer that like, oh, no, that really would not work. So um, I know that I know I've got something wrong here. And so I'm going to I'm going to try again with something else because I know I can't draw a mechanism where I have a primary carbocation. So questions about that? So then let's also take a look at the um, the other potential here, which would be a substitution mechanism. So let's say this time I want you to draw the both the um, product and the mechanism. So again, very similar to the example we had before. But one crucial difference in that we have a primary alcohol. Uh, oh, so question, do they always form an alkene? So dehydration reactions will always form an alkene, yes. Oops, let's go back up here. When we, uh, and the reason for that is that actually they are also substituting. But if you imagine what would the nucleophile be here, the nucleophile is water. So if it were to do a substitution, you, you've just made the exact same thing. So there's no product there. Um, so the actual product that you could form is, is always going to be the alkene in that case. If you have a different nucleophile of some sort, then you could start forming um, to see over here in this example. So see if you can draw the product and mechanism for this one.
So once again, if somebody can just type something in when you have uh, a guess, when you have something. Um, this one, we're going to have, again, kind of a combination of the last couple skills. So first we have an alcohol, so it needs to be protonated in order to become a leaving group. So we're going to do that. And then we have um, a prime, we notice that it's a primary alcohol, so it's not going to form a carbocation. So instead we're going to have SN2 type uh, chemistry here. So we're going to grab that hydrogen, protonate the alcohol. Okay. And then we're going to do SN2 chemistry here, not SN1, to form our final product. So to sum up uh, both the mechanisms and the products, if we have secondary or tertiary alcohols, we're talking about SN1 and E1. If we have primary alcohols, we're looking at SN2 and E2. And in both cases, we have to protonate the alcohol first to make it into a better leaving group. Questions? Everybody good with that so far? Okay, thanks. Let's, uh, so before we get into one more, um, or a, a totally different thing. So th as you might imagine, let's think more synthetically. We've, uh, synthetically meaning like those questions at the end of the last exam where you had some transformation and you had to come up with a sequence of steps. That's really like, as I've said a couple times, one of the major goals that you should be able to do in this class. You collect all these reactions and eventually you can plan out these fairly um, elaborate synthesis plans of how to get from this molecule to this molecule. Um, so think about now how these things could be useful in that sense. So let's say we have alcohol molecules that we're starting with. We now have ways to turn them into halogens which is useful because then they can do other types of substitution chemistry, um, substituting with all the other nucleophiles that we saw in the last chapter. We also now some dehydration reactions, which are ways to form alkenes from alcohols. So now, if we started with an alcohol, now we've opened up all access to all the rest of the reactions we've already learned. Um, like, let's say, for example, that you wanted to do a, a, um, a transformation like this. Start with cyclohexanol, a common alcohol.
right? So let's say we have something like this. We want we want to start with cyclohexanol, and we want to end with trans one two dibromocyclohexane. Now that's definitely going to be more than one step because there's no reaction that just takes an alcohol on one carbon and all of a sudden makes bromines on two carbons like that. But if we use our skills of retrosynthetic analysis, which is working backwards, and we think about what we could do here, uh, we start over here and we think, all right, so from this, what kinds, what kind of molecule, what kind of functional group could we use to make something like this? Uh, any guesses? What kind of molecule might Ignore this for now. Just, just thinking about this. What kind of molecule could we get this from? Yeah, so Br2, what, what, what does that react with? Yep. What does that react with? If we want to use bromine as a reagent, what, what would our substrate here look like? What would our other molecule here look like? Kind of functional group would it have? No guesses? Well, you've seen reactions like this. So Br2 does react to form that, but what does it have to react with? What other kind of what kind of molecule reacts with dibromine to make this kind of a product? So it's alkenes, right, from chapter five? Right? So alkenes, like cyclohexene in this case, could react with Br2 to form a product like that. So we know that reaction. So when we see this kind of a dibromine, trans-dibromine type situation, we can think, oh yeah, that's bromine reacting with an alkene. So then we look at the back, the next step and say, all right, well, what do we get alkenes from that might be more like this? And right there, we see one of our new reactions, which is that dehydration reaction. Right? So if we heat up that cyclohexanol with some acid, we can dehydrate the alcohol to make the alkene, and now we have uh, a way to add bromine. The solvent, so, I mean, yes, the way the book writes this, they always include this with a dichloromethane solvent. Um, I don't know, I don't know that the solvent is always that important, uh, and, and it can be different. In this case, because bromine is this, like, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's a brown fuming liquid, which means it's always making this, like, brown smoke coming off of it very dramatic. Uh, so as a reagent, we often use bromine dissolved in something like dichloromethane to do that transformation. Um, I think the only time that it's really important to specify the solvents is when it potentially affects the reaction. Uh, so in the example, like from the last chapter, when we, when the solvent could make the difference between SN1 and SN2, uh, or E1 and E2, then yes, it's important to specify the solvent. Um, otherwise, I'm, I'm trying to think of some examples. It's always okay to put the solvent in there. Yeah, I'm talking about, so in that case, that's not a solvent, that's a catalyst. And that definitely is important because the difference between 
just having hydrogen with a, a standard metal catalyst versus having it with that Lindlar's catalyst totally changes the outcome. Either you're reducing from all the way to the alkane or you're just reducing to the alkene. So that's a big difference. That's not the solvent. Um, in this case, it is the solvent. So the reagents, catalysts always need to be listed. Solvents, not, not necessarily always if they don't affect the reaction too much. Um, yeah, sorry, I can't be more absolute about that, but that's just how it goes. Uh, sometimes it makes a difference and sometimes it doesn't. All right, so um, let's look at another one of these. Again, using this kind of a reaction. We'll use something similar to our example today. Can you all hear my son practicing piano? Like some nice background music. So we got this, and let's say we want that. So once again, let's think about how we would analyze something like this. First, what initially appears to be happening may or may not actually be what's happening or what's important here so what i mean by that is it looks like the oh is kind of shifting from this carbon to this one it looks like it's jumping over right because we're starting with one butanol ending with two butanol um but we don't know any reaction that causes an oh to simply jump over one carbon that's not something so if there's not a direct transformation there, then we have to think about this as a multi-step transformation. We have to say, all right, then there must be multiple things going on here, um, multiple steps. So let's think about it step by step. So when we think about it step by step, again, we're going to start from the end and we're going to say, what kind of a thing can we get that from? And here we have some various choices. Um, so one choice would be Substitution, right? We, we can we can do substitution on an alkyl halide uh, to make an alcohol using using water, or using hydroxide or something. Also, think about this as coming from an alkene, like maybe that one, or maybe that one. Both of those through hydration would would do that, right? Um, So like if we're thinking about this one, maybe we're thinking water in some kind of SN2 conditions. If we're thinking this, either of these, we're thinking like hydration, hydration of alkenes, which is going to selectively hydrate, it's going to selectively hydrate this one here. This one, it could go either way. It's not really clear. Like, like in the dibromine, it was pretty clear. Oh, yeah, we, we take an alkene, we add Br2 to it, and we've got the, um, the product. This one, there's a couple different possibilities. And that's often going to be the case. There's going to be very, especially as we learn more reactions, there's various ways that you can make that product. So we have to narrow down these choices and decide what works best. And the way that we do that is by, again, looking backwards. So we take this and we say, all right, let's assume... Let's start with this one since I wrote that one down first, this, this um, 2 bromo butane. So we can get from 2 bromo butane to butanol, 2 butanol this way. Great. Let's look backwards. How do we get from bromine back to this? That's not as clear, right? It's going to take a couple more steps at least to do that. Um, this doesn't obviously come from something like this especially given the, the reactions of alcohols we know so far. So that maybe isn't a great choice. And one important part about planning these syntheses out 
is don't get excited about your first choice. Um, so we wrote that down first, but that doesn't mean that was the best way to go. And as we're looking backwards, it seems like maybe that's not the best way to go. That's not obviously something we can make from a primary alcohol easily. So let's look at these. Uh, if we started with an alkene, is an alkene something we can get from an alcohol? And the answer to that is yes. We just talked about that, how we can dehydrate alcohols to make alkenes. Now, is one of these easier to make than the other or faster to make from this particular alcohol? I think, again, we would say yes. Um, to me, we have a very direct, easy line to get from this primary alcohol to this terminal or end alkene through dehydration, right? E2 dehydration, where we heat this thing up with some concentrated acid. And hopefully, we can remove the water, dehydrate, and get this alkene. And now we've kind of got a path. So we decided in this case that this is probably not the best choice. Um, this is probably not the best choice. This one here is going to work the best. And sometimes it takes more work than that. Sometimes it takes a few steps before you realize, yeah, this isn't really going to work. I can't find a good path here. I'm going to have to try something else. Um, and that's OK. This is a type of a problem that takes a lot of trial and error, that takes some working out. And eventually, you try to find the right path. This is not the kind of a question where you, you just look at it and you see the right answer, at least until you have um, a lot more practice. So, our best path here, probably putting together all of that mess, is to first dehydrate this with concentrated acid and heat. And um, if we wanted to be even more specific here, this is OK. But if we want to be even more specific, we note that really we want this, we want some sort of concentrated acid. Because we want to make sure that we're dehydrating and not just um, not just reforming alcohols. But in this case, either way is OK, because we want to end up hydrating again anyway. Right. So we dehydrate to form our, our alkene, and then hydrate with dilute acid to form our secondary alcohol. So if we're planning this out, we're dehydrating and then rehydrating, but to make it go on a different carbon. Now, uh, practically in the lab, if you needed to do something like this, you could actually just use dilute acid and, and kind of heat it up and just hope that, because this is a thermodynamically favored product, that that's what you're going to end up with. Um, but the important thing here is to recognize the, the plan, that we find something that we can make this from, and then we find something we can make that from that eventually leads us back to our starting material. All right, we're going to look at a couple more reactions, and then we'll put this together because that, that idea, that skill some more. So, um, all right, so we looked at that SN2 reaction where, or SN1 or SN2, where we turn an OH into a BR through substitution. As it turns out, that's not a super um, great reaction practically. So there's another way that primary and secondary alcohols are often converted to halides so that they can be used in, some, in other things, substitution reactions and so forth, that work, works a lot better. And that's using something called thionyl chloride, which is SOCl2, often written like this, although people would debate whether or not there's really a double bond between the S and the O. Thionyl chloride here is a reagent that's used to convert primary and secondary alcohols easily and 
and uh, um, reliably into chlorides. The solvent that's usually used here is pyridine. is this it's a good base and um works as a nice solvent for this reaction this is one of the reactions one of the first reactions I guess we looked at a couple of alkene reactions, but we're not going to look at the mechanism. So this is one where you just need to know SOCl2 converts OH to Cl. And we're not going to mess with how that actually happens. Uh, you can, it's, it's actually not in the book, but you can look it up in a more advanced text if you're curious. Um, or online, but we just want to know that's like another reaction to put in our toolbox for our synthetic transformations that if we want to make a chloride from an alcohol, this is a way to do it. All right, next reaction. Oxidation of alcohols. So alcohols can be oxidized. Remember our definition of oxidation. We're going to not think of it so much in the general chemistry sense of losing electrons, although that is still valid. It's not wrong. It's just easier with organic reactions to think about oxidation as either gain of hydrogen or, or sorry, gain of oxygen or loss of hydrogen. because that causes carbon to increase its oxidation state. So you can still do the oxidation state accounting, but it's just more convenient to think of oxidation as gaining oxygen or losing hydrogen. Uh, we talked about reduction as being the uh, gain of hydrogen to alkenes or reducing alkenes. So now we're gonna talk about oxidations of alcohols where uh, we turn alcohols into Carbonyls. Carbonyls, remember, are C double bond oxygen. And these are pretty easily prepared from alcohols using, again, things that we're not going to look specifically at the mechanism for. Uh, it's just a little bit beyond the scope of this class, but we do want to know how do we make how do we make um, these things from, from alcohols. So we're generally going to use chromium catalysts um, for this. Chromium in high oxidation states is highly oxidizing. So a couple different um, a, a couple different reagents that you might see for this. I'll try to be pretty consistent uh, in terms of here. But there, there's a, the, the, the substance that you can buy is CRO3, which if you, again, going back to that general chemistry stuff, which we would call chromium-6. Oxide. And so that six is a really high oxidation state. You might also hear about this, um, like, especially like in the news, this is sometimes called hexavalent chromium, uh, meaning chromium with a plus six oxidation state. It's a really important pollutant because a lot of 
uh, a lot of industries that were using these types of catalysts in large amounts kind of just dumped everything into the environment before there were rules on that kind of thing and after there are rules also. So chromium, um, high valency chromium is a, a, a major pollutant. Uh, it's really uh, toxic, carcinogenic uh, because of its oxidative potential. I think the the movie uh, Aaron Brockovich about the lawyer who goes after the company's polluting, I, I believe that has to do with hexavalent chromium. In a lab setting, it can be an effective catalyst when using smaller amounts. Industry is kind of getting away from chromium catalysts because in large amounts, you've got all this really dangerous chromium waste that you don't want to be dumping into the environment. And so you have to pay a lot to have it disposed of properly. So when chrome, chromium six oxide is mixed with water, you make something called chromic acid. Which is an extremely strong oxidant. So it's something that can oxidize other things. And it's used as a reagent in our case. It's also used as a um, cleaning solution for labs where you have all kinds of nasty chemical residues that you need to clean off of glass. Chromic acid won't react with glass, but it will react with most other stuff or a lot of other stuff. So back to our, our purposes here. If you take a primary alcohol and you react it with chromic acid, you can actually turn that alcohol into a carboxylic acid. So an alcohol gets oxidized by this chromium reagent to a carboxylic acid. Sorry, we also need um, acid up here, I forgot. So we'll put some sulfuric acid in there. Now, because chromic acid is not like a thing that you can buy, you have to make it because it's so reactive. So you buy chromium oxide, you mix it with water and sulfuric acid, and that gives you the chromic acid that does this. So what you'll see in the book is instead of chromic acid being listed as the reagent, the reagents are listed as chromium-6 oxide, sulfuric acid, and water. Because that's actually what you would take off the shelf to mix together to do this thing. Um, but the effective reagent that you're making in solution is this one. So you can oxidize primary alcohols to carboxylic acids using a, a, a high valent chromium catalyst like that. Right. Now, what you um, may notice is that an alcohol actually in doing this, it's kind of going through two steps. It's first uh, oxidizing to the carbonyl, which would be an aldehyde, and then oxidizing to the carboxylic acid. So the carboxylic acid is sort of like two steps oxidized. Uh, what if we want a aldehyde instead? As we'll see in another um, couple chapters, aldehydes are very useful uh, for doing their own types of, of other chemistry. So when, when we talk about things like synthesis, it would be really nice if we can make aldehydes and not carboxylic acids. So there's a way to do this also using a reagent called PCC. It's also a chromium-based reagent. Let's talk about that. PCC stands for pure 
pyridinium fluorochromate. And what you do is you take, um, you take again, the CRO3, chromium-6 oxide, and you have some um, HCl as the acid this time to, to kind of make a chromic acid-like thing. But then you react it with pyridine, that molecule we saw up, uh, up here before, here, pyridine, which precipitates the salt pyridinium chlorochromate, which is basically a less strong oxidant. So instead of oxidizing all the way to the acid, we can, we can stay at the aldehyde. So if you wanna see what, what that looks like, pyridinium, you don't have to know this structure. You just have to know PCC uh, oxidizes alcohols to aldehydes. So this is pyridine. Pyridinium would be the ion form of this. So the protonated, the conjugate acid of pyridine. And then it's paired with this negative salt chlorochromate, which is CrO3Cl minus. Pyridinium chlorochromate. We're again, not going to look at a mechanism for that, but we're just going to remember that this reagent is something we can use to uh, oxidize alcohols to aldehydes. can also use this, use this to oxidize secondary alcohols, right? This is a secondary alcohol to ketones. So primary alcohols to aldehydes, secondary alcohols to ketones using this reagent. All right, questions about those? Reactions. So before we go on to um, ethers and epoxides and stuff, the rest of the chapter, let's again think about some of these synthetic transformations using some of these reactions that we've done so far. So I want to give you a couple different uh, a couple different problems here to work on over the next couple of minutes, and then we'll we'll look at them together. Sorry, wrong thing. Okay, so there's one. And then another one is They're both from the book, by the way. So you may encounter them again in your homework. Okay, so two different transformations. Both of these are going to be multi-step. Um, so take a few minutes and see if you can come up with some transformations that would work on these, um, given the time, maybe just focus on uh, this first one for now. But again, starting backwards, start thinking about what can I make this from, then what can I make that from, and so on until we get um, back to the beginning. These are 
they're going to be hard. But just take it step by step and see what you can come up with. How's this going? Any luck? Think you got something? Another minute or so. This is where 
I really miss our in-person class because I would love to be able to walk around and see what kinds of stuff you all are coming up with. Um, so as we talk about these, in many cases, there are many possible answers that would work. So if you have something that you think works and you don't have a good way of displaying it um, on your WebEx right now because it's not on a computer, um, then if you have a question about it, don't assume that it's wrong just because it's not exactly the same as what I'm about to do. Send it to me, send me a picture of it or something, and would this work also so I can take a look at it and, and let you know. In many cases, there are multiple possible correct answers for these, um, but there are also, of course, many wrong answers. So I want to make sure that you're on the right track. All right, let's take a look at the first one, and maybe we'll save this one uh, to think about for next time. So we've got um, this transformation where this alkyl cyclohexyl methyl cyclohexyl bromine, bromine thing is uh, getting converted to this ketone, which is on a totally different carbon. Looks like the methyl group is sticking around, staying in its place, so it's not being messed with in this transformation. So what is happening? Um, so it's really easy to get overwhelmed with these types of problems if you're just thinking about this as like one thing. Oh, how do I get from here to here? There's too many possibilities. There's too many things. So again, I encourage you to start from the end. Think about what kinds of things do we make this from, and then work backwards from there. So to me, especially since this is just what we talked about, the only way we've made any kind of carbonyl so far is through the oxidation of alcohols. So I might say, all right, um, I think my first guess is that this is coming from this with one of those chromium oxidation type things that we just talked about, like PCC. So we're using that to oxidize the secondary alcohol to a ketone. OK, great. That doesn't really help us in terms of like, it, this doesn't look any better, any closer to the beginning. but. That's how these things work. We have to take it step by step and we have to think, all right, well, we're starting here um, and, and we'll see where we go from here. So now I'm looking at these two and I'm thinking, hmm, um, this OH is on this carbon, but this bromine is over on this carbon. How am I going to get this thing to like switch? It doesn't, that's not something that we've really learned specifically. So then I'm thinking, well, what about how else could we get an OH at that particular position that would maybe connect these? And the only thing that comes to mind then is the opposite regioselectivity version of hyd uh, hydration. So we could add water across the alkene, but do it with the opposite selectivity. And the way that we do that is with our hydroboration oxidation. Right, we learned that reaction as a way to add alcohol to a double bond, but to put the OH or to add water to a double bond on the less substituted carbon. Remember that reaction. So the reason that that seems like a good choice and how to make this alcohol as opposed to substitution or something like that is because that allows us to have a functional group now that connects these two um, carbons. And that might give us a path back to this one. And in fact, it does. Because now, if we think about, can we make this kind of an alkene from this kind of an alkyl halide, the answer is yes, we can do that through uh, E2 elimination. So any kind of strong elimination base, we don't want it in this case to be a big base because we don't want um we don't want to make this uh this one this this alkene we want we want the more substituted alkene so something like sodium hydroxide would work here um, heat that up and eliminate so that would be an e2 elimination eliminate to form the alkene then so now we have a full path so if we were to uh, list these steps sequentially. We would do our elimination, followed by our hydroboration oxidation, which is actually two steps. Sorry, 
sorry, this is small. Um, let's put it in there. And then finally, we would oxidize that alcohol. So that's our that's our plan, our synthetic plan. And how we came up with that was from working backwards, thinking about wh what do we make this from? What do we make this from? What do we make this from? So on. Questions about that one? More steps two and three again. Uh, they're they're this here: the hydroboration and oxidation. So the BH three THF and then NaOH and H two O two hydrogen peroxide. So you can uh, refer to chapter five. This is called hydroboration oxidation. Oops, I had to lower that. Hydroboration oxidation. All right, that's a really tough one. I think you'll find this next one is not quite as hard as this one. Um, but again, these things take work, they take practice. And uh, there's a whole bunch of them in the book. If you look at page uh, 264, there are, I don't know, like 20 of these not quite 20 of them, uh, for you to practice. So please go through those as we work our way through the chapters. Some of them are, um, we haven't quite hit all the reactions yet, but many of them you should be able to complete. The um, Monday we'll finish chapter eight, get into chapter nine a little bit, and we'll keep working on these kinds of transformations. There are a bunch of these on the quiz as well. So you've got two weeks for the quiz, uh, keep working on that. Again, let me know if you need help, especially if, have a lot more availability um, now. So yeah, let me know if you need help. Otherwise, uh, stay safe, stay inside. Have a good rest of the week. If you want to stick around right now to ask questions, I'm happy to stick around. Otherwise, I'll see you uh, Monday if I don't hear from you before. I'll keep working on those quizzes and get them posted for you um, hopefully soon. everybody. Does anybody have questions? Anybody talk about whatever, different reactions, other things? You can just talk or send messages in the chat if you have questions. The message not get through? Oh, I, uh, maybe not. Did you send a message? I did. I had a question about um, if the PCC does anything to a tertiary alcohol. Oh, um, yeah, good question. No, I, did, I didn't see that message. Um, I don't, I don't see the message. So the answer is no. Um, and the reason is you imagine what would happen you can't you can't do something like that because that carbon has five bonds so there needs to be at least one hydrogen on this carbon 
so that you can make the double bond. Otherwise, there's just not enough space there to do it. What about the chromic acid then? Same thing. If there's too many carbons there, there's just nothing you can do um, because you can't you can't have five bonds to a carbon. So that's that's not going to exist. Can so secondary alcohol? Right. Um, Secondary alcohol, there's a hydrogen here. So then we can we can do we can get rid of that hydrogen and get rid of both hydrogens actually here and here and end up with, with the carbonyl. Oh no, no, I was talking about the uh, chromic acid in a secondary alcohol. That can happen. Yes. So yes, so you can use um, just straight chromic acid to do this. So if we were doing a, a transformation, I could either use going from a secondary alcohol, I could do the PCC into a ketone, or I could do the uh, chromic acid into a ketone. Yep. Yeah, they would both work in that case. Um, generally, because chromic acid is such nasty stuff, uh, I think you'll see it more, especially like in the book, you'll see the PCC used more just in general, just because it's nicer, it's, it's easier to use, it's less dangerous. Um, uh, chromic acid is all organic, well, pretty much all organic stuff. So it's, um, so generally you'll see the PCC used more, but they would both do that, yes. So this is uh, on page through, uh, 244, the book, this kind of goes through this. Let me pull this over here. I don't know if you can see it, it's gonna be pretty small, but um, secondary alcohols oxidized to ketones by both chromic acid and PCC. All right, so you can see that there. Um, and then the tertiary alcohols are resistant to oxidation because the carbon can't form the carbon and oxygen Double bond. Another example of that. Is there a time where it would actually be easier to use the Either one of the mechanisms? Either one of what? From, well, like aside from real world in that chromic acid is nasty stuff, theoretically speaking, is there a time where it would be easier to do it in a transformation? Um, the only one I can think of, the only way I could think of it is, let's say you have multiple alcohols on your molecule and one of them you want to make, one's a primary alcohol that you want to make into a carboxylic acid, but the other ones are all secondary, you might just use chromic acid so that everything gets oxidized as much as possible. Um, but in terms of just specifically a secondary alcohol, no, there isn't any theoretical reason for it. The, the other thing that happens sometimes is just, you know, we write all these reactions on paper, but when you try them in the lab, sometimes they just don't work, even though it totally seems like they should work. Uh, so that would be another example where, again, it's not theoretical, it's not on paper, but you might try to oxidize a secondary alcohol with PCC and it just doesn't work. And so you go, okay, well, I guess we got to try a stronger oxidation and then you would use the chromic acid. But that's not something we would expect looking at, at um, paper. Uh, this, this particular one, I believe that the book is giving is an example of that, where this particular molecule, because of the 
stereochemistry and the cyclohexane geometry and stuff is somewhat is somewhat harder to oxidize and so they they would use the chromic acid instead but that's not something that i would expect you to, to be able to uh, identify all right because yeah in the example that we were doing just now where mm -hmm. um, i had instead of pcc i had actually written the uh chromic acid that's why yeah, I was that would be Other questions, issues? Okay, sorry, just one more. Yeah. Um, in my notes, I had written down that dehydration of alcohols is always E1, but then in another part, I put that it could be E1 or SN1. So dehydration would always be E, it would always be elimination because if you're losing water, you're losing H and OH, that's elimination. It could be E1 or E2 depending on the alcohol. So um, if we have a primary alcohol, where did we do that? Let's back up here. Uh, so, so sorry, if we have um, secondary and tertiary alcohols, that dehydration is going to go E1. If we have primary alcohols, then we're going to go E2. That's right. Substitution is never considered dehydration because you're not really losing water. You're, you're substituting OH with something else. So primary is always E2, tertiary and secondary E1. For elimination, right, for dehydration, yeah. They can also undergo substitution, but that's different. That's not dehydration. Gotcha. Thank you guys. See you next day. Yeah, thank you. See you Monday.
I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna cancel unless or I'm gonna end the meeting unless anybody else has anything else.